Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We have a treat for you today, boys and girls. Eastman and Laird have joined us today to talk Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, issue number two. We're piggybacking off of the conversation we had with Peter Laird uh, when we looked at the very first issue. We're getting into the nitty gritty right here. Uh, it's an unbelievable conversation. I can't believe we made it happen. This channel has uh, surprised me in more times than I can uh, count on uh, one hand, certainly. And this might be the biggest moment in cartoonist kayfabe history. Enjoy the video. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we left off uh, looking at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue number one with Peter Laird. Thank you so much for uh, for gracing us with your presence, Peter, and, and chatting comics. It was such a good time. We had to figure out like like. What else can we do? Can we can we can we get Eastman and Laird? We did the shoot interviews with each dude individually. Can we get Eastman and Laird on the channel and continue the conversation about uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles and 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 its growth and and talk some craft stuff? You know, like you guys uh, certainly rereading this material o over the past week in prep for this. I do not think that you uh, you guys get enough credit for the craft part of. The process. The, the comics are actually really, really good, but you never hear that in interviews or articles. It's always about the, the wild success and things. So the beauty of what we have going on here today is that we're going to be able to uh, go through these issues and, and talk craft stuff and get into some of the nuance al along the way that uh, sort of went into creating the comic and some of the growth that came like from the production of this stuff. So, so thank you guys so much for being here. Thank sure. you. We have the IDW slipcase issues that we're <clears throat> we're, we're check, taking a look at. It's cool because we still got the duo tone with you know it's that it's not like colored over top or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. I've uh, got that we got this wrapped uh, mouser cover. First off, who who uh, who designed that mouser? Because that that feels like you can't just put that in a sketchbook one time. That looks like that was developed. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did that design originally. Oh, 100 percent. Were you sitting on it for a while, or was that for this issue? Well, actually, uh, rereading this issue made me remember something that I'm not sure if Kevin remembers, but I remember being in Dover, and I was working on uh, a science fiction story. I think I was planning to uh, uh, do it in, in just in text and prose, and it involved a guy who created a, uh, a rat-hunting robot and it would like run around in the sewers or in, in the basement of buildings, find rats, ch ch chomp them and kill them, and then swallow them and then poop them out in a, in a little plastic bag. <laughs> do you remember that, Kev? I, I don't. I don't remember that specifically. But what I what I do remember very clearly is, um, um, besides being a huge fan of. Um, Peter's artwork and drawing um, such a fine draftsman that he had this wonderful ability to make and draw robots and machinery to me that look like they work. Um, you know, much like he showed me this, some concepts for a um, tuck of Sherwood. It was kind of robot based Robin Hood tale. Um, of course, the designs for Fugitoid and some of the things we want to do that. But he had all these wonderful drawings of, um, I think some of them were star wars based and uh um, but just these robots seem to, to come alive and uh and, and and if it was that idea that inspired it was definitely so great when we when you brought it over to the ideas we were kicking around a few different ideas of what issue two would be um and uh because you know with issue one being you know uh, a parody homage beginning middle and end we never really kind of thought it'd be a second issue but we had such a great time putting everything we we wanted and we loved about comics and you know borrowed borrowed heavily from everybody put all of our favorite isms in there um but when we had to come up with a more original story a rat in the sewer um and i could definitely see the linkage of your original idea you mentioned pete with this one and you came up with a a bunch of these designs and they just looked awesome they look like they work and they were also terrifying especially if you were splinter looking at one of those things coming at you down the on the sewer peter's name is on the cover uh solely uh peter did you also do the the airbrush color on the first version this looks kind of computer colored compared to what i remember the uh the original looking yeah. like i i did that cover actually you may have realized this already but in the early days 
Kevin and I swapped off covers. You know, he would do. He did the first one. I did uh, the cover for number two. He did the cover for number three. I did the cover for number four. Uh, as far as the, an airbrush on that cover, I, it, the cover was done very much like the one for the first issue, where, where it was a black and white, and then a, a cover overlay for the red color. Um, and in the and in this one, uh, I remember using my airbrush to spray tone work, tone chemical on the original. Mm. which was probably not a great idea. Pro pro probably want a respirator for, yeah, uh, really. <laughs> uh, for that, man. Like when you have the word chemical and spray, there's a few ways that could go, man. Uh, bef Maybe. Before uh, we split last time, Peter, uh, there were two stories that, that uh, I wanted to sort of get on the record that we didn't finish the thread or it was set off camera. One, you said that uh, there was some sort of misprint or something on, on the original issue two, <laughs> and all of those copies like came direct like if it hit the store it came from your hands rather than a distributor yeah, yeah i'm sure kevin remembers this uh, i believe it was the first printing of issue number two printed by the lakeville journal in lakeville connecticut they shipped them to my, my house and kevin and i went through every single copy because they had done a, a kind of a crappy job trimming the, the books and <laughs> I think there probably ended up there were several hundred that were trimmed so poorly that we couldn't sell them. And uh, we went, I think that was a, a print run of, I think, 15,000. And we went through every single one, flipping through it to make sure that the, um, the, the trimming had done, been done properly. But it was a, an enormous pain in the butt. <laughs> and, and, for the, and for the people at home, what, what were... I believe what you're talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, because this has happened to me a couple of times where I got a print job back and rather than a nice rectangle of a book, I guess it would be a rhombus or something. <laughs> there would be like a little slash cut out. I have comics in my collection like that. So <laughs> some of those slip through. So if you measure yeah. like the spine to spine and then you measure like the exterior, you're getting maybe a quarter inch off half inch and it is so fucking glaring yeah that yeah. It, it makes you i mean you who the only answer is to fucking do some trims yourself yeah well, you know, just throw them out yeah throw them out. well you know what's funny is um you know going back to even issue one which is which is kind of humorous when uh if i remember right and correct me pete if uh you remember differently but i i remember when we were looking for a printer there was this local printer the lakeville journal that had uh they would do these um uh free kind of tv facts tv guide kind of things yeah. um, and they would be left outside convenience stores you know they'd be supported by local advertising and so we went to the lakeford journal i remember two things one was um i was really irritated by the fact that the guy had a really messy desk it was stuff piled everywhere <laughs> um but we, but we said you know we want to do the this kind of book and and talked about prices and got all that so um when we took the book in and got it printed and they came back and they were larger in size. I think we might have forgot to tell them to make them comic size, which is why we ended up with a larger size. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't, I remember, it wasn't until people started complaining that it was bigger than a regular comic size that we, that it dawned on us that we hadn't done it properly. <laughs> and I think with um, issue two, if I remember, because I think we wanted a glossy cover like we have on issue one. Right. And I think we were also surprised when uh, all those copies showed up that were badly trimmed, but they also had a, a matte finished cover. And we yeah, were like, that was pretty strange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all the good old days when, but we were like, oh, well, you know, and I think, you know, that I don't know how much did we, I think because issue three, they messed up too. And I don't know if we did issue four forward then well, there's at some point we we ended up moving to southern duchess news but um yeah i'd love to know, actually get a, get into all all that stuff too through, through the the conversation uh so like looking at this two-page spread where we have a margin uh in the gutters so i'm assuming that the printer wasn't even able to do like full bleed well uh, they, they might have been able to do it but they certainly didn't do it <laughs> I'm sorry, and, and some of that is the when IDW did the reprint version of that because that's the reprint. They actually did it um, in a slightly different format. It's um, uh, it's more magazine size, right. and so if you look, you'll see larger borders than what um, Pete's got the original there. Did they did have the same gap, Pete? Yeah, oh, see no, the no. original. 
the original is. comes pretty close, um, but it was, you know, still, <laughs> still not perfect. <laughs> um, but when IDW did the, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, big Brother is watching you. Um, <laughs> but I think when uh, IDW did the reprint, it was it got a little, um, was a little more spread out because yeah, when they did like the, uh, this was from the big hardcover collection, which was so much fun. They they did get it uh, closer. Oh, to yeah, the, that looks good. Yeah, closer to the right. So. Um, but yeah, that was, um, you know, I think, um, in those days, uh, I think issue one was, uh, cost us around 11 to $1,200 for 3000 copies, black and white with the two color cover. And, uh, um, so that was, uh, for our needs and necessities as, um, very naive self publishers, it was, uh, <laughs> it was the dollar, it worked for sure. us. So, because yeah. it, I already spent all of our, you know, savings and fortunes on the duo shade paper. Yeah, but I don't remember, know if you remember this, but we actually got from back from the printer three thousand two hundred and seventy-five copies because they did a little bit of overprinting. Oh, sweet. And I, and I only found that out like a year or two ago when I was going through some old letters, uh, probably writing to my brother Don, and the, I mentioned that to him. But it's something <laughs> I had completely forgotten about. You know, because a lot of people have asked over the years, like of that first printing, how many of those actually ended up, you know, getting out to the public. And I know that, you know, we kept um, maybe 100, 150 of each. I'm not sure. But then um, I know that we gave quite a few of them away to friends and family and, the, and those kinds of things. Uh, but I, I would guess somewhere around 20, 2,500 to 2,600 maybe actually made it into the distribution because we originally did that one ad we would sell them um, single single copy mail order um Speaking of no. you sell publishers yeah <laughs> we got those remember you feel at a couple of those calls and they go hey we want to we want to buy some of your books and you told them how much you know it's like well they're dollar 50 plus and they go no no that's not how it works and and i think we were like okay hang up we'll call them back and we had to talk <laughs> about it to go like Oh, well, let's give him ten percent off. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, "No, it's more like sixty yeah, percent." Anyway. That was a shocker. Yeah, yeah. Do you end up losing money on like that first? You know, some some of those first issues because you're selling them at such a big discount. You know, whenever the stores call. No, I think we actually cleared some some profit on on those early books. Not a lot, but but yep. significantly. That's a lesson to the self-publishers out there because we we know people who, uh, who who have a cover price on a book and sometimes it costs them more money. Yeah, yeah. wholesale prices don't 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 work if you're not careful. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, can you see your hand in here? Uh, we asked Peter last time and, and he said it's pretty indistinguishable. And I wonder if we, as we go through these pages, if you can see the pieces you inked or anything like that. Well, you know, I think my my recollection and what was so fun about um the early the early years of peter and i working together especially what's so interesting about issue two um is um after we had done issue one i had to, i went back and and worked the summer in a gunk i was still cooking lobsters and then that fall i moved back to portland maine <clears throat> um and got a job there and i was doing night classes and pete and his um, incredible wife Janine had moved down to she got a teaching job in Sharon Connecticut and so they moved there and so Pete and I were um, sending um, uh, letters back and forth and so Pete started doing some of the breakdowns and layouts as we talked about the story I had made a couple bus trips down uh, at least one or two and as we started piecing it together so this was kind of a uh, not only shared layouts where um, Pete did initial breakdowns and layouts um, for chunks of the story. Um, I brought in some ideas of different bits and pieces. I thought, you know, maybe we could pace this a little differently or maybe th this kind of shadow. And and we have both of the pieces I've um, I discovered um, uh, recently around the time that Pete and I were, were wrapping up a, um, a documentary shoot and uh, um, was able to get Pete back all and I didn't realize I had him, which is funny. I had all of his original <laughs> pencils. Um, I guess the the hoarder in me, you know, oh, I'm taking these. Um, so I ended up being able to give Pete back his original breakdowns and and that um, for the layouts, and so we could see the comparison of how our ideas melded together. Um, but Pete, being a much more experienced artist um, uh, than I was in the early days, especially that um, um, 
and our styles were slightly different, that we would try to, um, and this is, I think, issue two, it really kind of evolved more, was try to get some of each of us on maybe every panel or every page would be, we'd ink a little here, ink a little there, and pass the pages back and forth to try to make this, the styles blend, which um, to me was quite effective because there is times I look at the stuff, but, you know, I, I'll tell you a thousand million percent, all those r mouses at the bottom of the pages, that's Pete. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the styles really started started blending wonderfully at this time and it's and sometimes it is a little harder to pick out um who did what there are these pieces that are kind of ronin-ish marks like uh from, from that period of like frank miller's work and i i often attribute that to to your hand kevin like, that's absolutely kevin yeah yeah you also got i also get to hide the, the fact that i didn't draw as well so <laughs> <laughs> it's all scratchy it's an effect <laughs> Taking a quick break to uh, pay the bills. Got to let you guys know that we have a Patreon and uh, the King Kayfabers on our Patreon are getting all of these videos uh, well before Gen Pop. And that includes this exact conversation with Eastman and Laird that uh, we are putting out into the world right now. They're getting these videos first. It mitigates the kayfabe effect. But these videos are also brought to you by the books that we make. Uh, out in the wild right now, I have uh, Red Room Crypto Killers issue number one is being uh, solicited to your comic shops. There are two other trade paperbacks, Red Room Trigger Warnings, uh, Red Room uh, The Antisocial Network. It's the 10th anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree. There are four volumes of that, uh, three volumes of X-Men Grand Design, and uh, the occasional WYSIWYG you may find out in the wild. Jimmy, tell the people what you have out there. I have Hulk Grand Design. It is coming to comic book stores shortly. If you haven't gotten it already, you should pre-order it. I like to think of it as the best looking Hulk book ever made. So pick it up and judge for yourself. My next book is Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. That is the 20th anniversary of Street Angel. It'll be collecting all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live and will look very nice on the shelf next to Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live. And uh, the first young adult graphic novel, The Plain Janes, is also available from me and Cecil Castellucci. You love us, right? We got Eastman and Laird back together to talk Turtles comics. Support the channel. Let's get back to the video. Yes. One, one, one thing I'd like to point out is that almost always when you see a, a bold black um, area, uh, you know, on a figure or in the background, that's Kevin. Because he always had a great sense of spotting blacks. Thank you. One of the greatest comic book practical jokes, I feel like, in, in the history of of uh, the medium and maybe pop culture is getting my mom to acknowledge Baxter Stock in some small way <laughs> through the character of Baxter Stockman. <laughs> genius title, genius title, and certainly a figure that I bugged my mom for. Looked aesthetically a little different. Yep. in the uh, the the cartoon uh, series as as well as April O'Neil, but this is the first appearance of those characters, as well as the Mousers. I just I just wanted to add something to what Kevin said a couple minutes ago um, about finding the uh, roughs that I did for part of the issue number two, and then he, he ended up sending them to me. Yes, and this was a couple of years ago, and it shocked the hell out of me because I thought for sure he had done all the layouts for issue two for years. I I thought that. And I, I think one of the reasons is this um, splash page in, in page one. Yes. That is, that is such a Kevin Eastman style <laughs> figure. Just just bold and coming at you. But it was really kind of interesting to see that, that I'd actually done, I think it was like 17 or 18 pages of layouts for the book. I'd completely forgotten that. One so of, thanks for being a hoarder, Kev. <laughs> one, one of the books that we have here is the uh, the first collection, and uh, there are individual spot illustrations that you guys will do throughout uh, to kind of buttress the actual issues. Maybe this one doesn't have it, but issue two definitely does, like volume two definitely does. And then we get to see what an exact Peter Laird turtle looks like, and then we see what an exact Kevin Eastman turtle looks like. So mm -hmm. it sort of it adds a little illumination to, to the whole scheme. Uh, after issue one, like how soon do you guys start putting uh, the pencil to paper on, on this issue? Oh, geez. It was later in the year, later in 84, I think. We started it maybe mid midsummer, early fall. You think, that, it's, you think it's some months after or? Weeks? Well, there was, a, there was a hiatus there. Where, as Kevin said, he, he went back to Maine and uh, was working at the lobster restaurant again and 
doing some other things there. And I had moved to Connecticut with my wife where she'd found a teaching job. And uh, so it was a little, we, we got, um, we, we lost some momentum there, but we, we knew we wanted to do a second issue because the first one had done so well for us. And uh, as Kevin pointed out, he, he made a couple of trips down to Sharon and uh, we got going on issue two. I wish I could remember exactly when that was. From from this point forward, though, uh, is it are you guys pretty clear on wanting to make cons a series out of this? Because there are some dangling threads left up to uh, the next issue. After there are some A and B stories that sort of pay off later. Well, I we think... knew that, that. Oh, sorry, Kev, you, you go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, we knew that we wanted to keep going with it because you know we'd sold. I think by that time, uh, like close to 15,000 copies of issue number one in several printings, I think. And that shocked the heck out of us because we, we were really thinking we'd be sitting on those things for, for years to come. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, I'm sure you know, um, we sold out the first printing of issue number one within a week, I believe. Uh, they were gone. So we knew, and then, you know, we did several other printings beyond that. And the, the response had just been way more than we expected. And uh, it, it, it was kind of a no brainer, you know, why not do another one, at least another one, see if, if this thing has some legs. And uh, so we somehow came up with that story for issue two. I can't remember exactly how that happened, but um, we did and it seemed to work. Yeah, I think that, um... You know, just to add to that, this to me, uh, <clears throat> um, one of the great things about issue two, and and I think that um, the sto the story concept, oftentimes is is a lot of um, Peter and I sit in the in the same room and 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 throwing out ideas and and slowly um, piecing together an idea that 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 makes us that makes a story work. But one of the things that I think is so monumental about issue two was not only did we we had, what we had learned about um, distribution into the um, direct uh, uh, direct distribution market was uh, issue one, especially with the second printing of issue one. So I think we did it right away in the summer of uh, eighty four. Another six thousand copies is there was a, a, a solicitation process. So you put out the solicitation, then X amount of months later that they would give you an order, and then you'd place that order for printing. Um, and I remember um, uh, um, um, a call from Peter uh, when the orders had come in from the different distributors. And at that time, there were quite a few of them. <clears throat> and he had mentioned that we were we, we, we had orders for somewhere around 14, 15,000. And had, he had also done some calculations where with the discounts, with the printing costs and all that stuff that that would make somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe a couple thousand dollars profit after everything was paid for. Um, and uh, and that's when I think we both said, you know, if we could do say six of these a year, five or six of these a year, um, we could probably make enough money to live on and, and, and literally start drawing comics full time. And it was, you know, shortly after, um, uh, um, the, 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 shortly into 1985 that I then packed everything up and moved to Sharon, Connecticut. And uh, that's where we really started drawing uh, comics full time. To me, I always call it the dream came true for us is that, you know, we wanted to follow in the footsteps of our heroes, um, like Jack Kirby and, and things. And, 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 you know, the dream of drawing uh, comics full time was was that childhood fantasy was there, whether it lasted one issue, two issues, or three <laughs> issues. Um, but we were, we were pretty psyched to do it. And uh, um, I have to say that I, I concur with Kevin on, on that dream come true thing, because it, it was literally a dream come true. You know, we, we both dreamed for about doing comics for so long. And, you know, I think we, we just kind of, when we got into it at first with that first issue of the Turtles, we kind of had this feeling like, well, we'll probably not sell them all, but it's, it's going to be fun. We'll at least have a comic book that we, we did ourselves. But then it turned out to be actually profitable. So, you know, the, the idea that we could we could do something we love doing, which was so much fun and make a living, as Kevin pointed out, it, it was fantastic. There's a really funny pacing piece right here that 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 I love. The, the first time I read this comic was in the, the, the first comics, Color Turtles. And the pacing was always funny because uh, 
April shows up in the lair. She's there with Splinter. She witnesses the turtles for the first time. She's freaking out. And uh, it's a panel to panel thing that happens right here. There's this blank spot. And I just thought that that was just the structure of the page. Uh, Splinter goes, not at all. Our story is a long story, though. Ellipsis. And then the very next panel is, uh, what a fantastic story. And it's just like cutting out all the exposition. <laughs> and, and then you see this in the original uh, format is that there was a little bit, rather than just do the little asterisk uh, yeah. editorial box in the bottom corner, it gets a panel devoted to it. And, and, and it's so funny that how a reading experience can change mm. just by you know, retooling like one or two panels. But Definitely. one of the things that I do want to make note of of this panel that is not in the colored uh, pieces is that this looks like the Kevin Eastman hand lettering from, from issue one. And the rest of this reprint that we're looking at has like the first comics, like is that, was that Steve Levine who, who, who did the lettering? Yep. Um, how many issues did you, did you letter, uh, Kevin, especially with you guys broken up and having to sh shuffle pages back and forth? Like, that seems like that could be a lot of downtime. So very curious, how many issues did you letter of the original run? I think it was um, through issue, what Peter's holding on, but it might've been through issue four because, um, and I think it was it was one of those that discussions early on where I had, um, yeah, that's mine. <laughs> I my I, I I couldn't I couldn't spell my way out of a paper bag. Fortunately, we had uh, Pete that would would do that with the, when he'd provide the final scripts. But uh, I think my my lettering was slightly neater than than Peter's, and I think maybe he didn't want to well, do it anyway. I so I ended go up beyond that. It was horrible, <laughs> horrible. <laughs> I freely admit it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that, um, uh, yeah, that, that it was probably um, one, two, three, probably Raphael, and then four. Um, but I have to look because um, and I think that was one of the things that we were really grateful when when Steve, who ended up being our kind of our first official employee, came and. Uh, um, oh my God! I'm looking up at a. Uh, issue six in this collection that still looks like my lettering i don't think i, I didn't think i lettered that far in but i know we had um pete i'm sorry uh steve go back and re-letter a lot of that stuff as we were doing different collection probably the first collections and it's funny i never noticed um i thought it's interesting you guys pointed out that little missing panel i never noticed that in the first comics collection i think because um when we did that first comics color collection i I actually did the, I hand colored the blue lines on issue one, and then they had an artist named uh, Ken Fedonowitz did mm -hmm. issue two. And I certainly wasn't happy <laughs> with this coloring. And Pete probably, I, you know, it was just April being pink and just, it was so many things that were just didn't seem like he had much of a color sense to me. Um, and then I think um, I may be wrong, but Christy Steele might've done issue three. Janice, Janice Cohen, does that name ring? Janice Cohen, yeah. yeah. And she was, because it was, yeah, I forget, one of them was married to Barry Smith for a while. I think that was Christy Steele. She did a lot of coloring. But Janice Cohen did a better job in issue three. But after that, Pete and I decided that uh, for the color collections, because <clears throat> Steve was a, w had a nice color sense. And then from that point on, um, we had Steve Levine do all the coloring for the um, for the color collections. We, we study this stuff at a molecular level, man. And and there was even stuff like as as artists. I'm glad you brought up the color for this issue because uh, while reading this, I saw that like even the colors kind of misidentifies stuff that you guys do in the art. It's like pretty accurate lighting for the underplane of this television. But he the colorist identifies like that little space, which is just shading on the carpet or whatever the ground material is. And he makes it a leg. And that's the kind of shit that makes you want to find a colorist, go to his house, <laughs> choke a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, you know, it's funny time too, not to digress on just the coloring thing, because it was fascinating to, 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 to Pete and I, because we'd always imagine it, you know, black, we never, well, it was a, it was a cost thing really, but the yeah. coloring was also making a bit of a transition at that time where most traditional comics, and I know Pete probably felt the same, like you'd look at these amazing Barry Smith Conan comics where the, that have like a, a thousand Moorish Persians attacking, you know, Conan standing on the top of them, and they're all blue. Right. <laughs> so it was, this, it was a mechanical coloring process where they had to 
kind of block out these areas and identify it by Pantone. So they couldn't really get very clever or, you know, it was such a fast turnover. And then around the time we started doing the stuff with first comics, they developed more of a system of, um, it was called blue line coloring, which you actually had kind of a clear acetate overlay of the black and white art. And it was exposed on a piece of paper that had an emulsion on it that would leave kind of a blue line outline. And so to color it, you literally had to block in the color, then sort of lift it, you know, lay in the black, <laughs> the acetate overlay to see if it works and then keep going back and forth. So I think it was transitional too, because the Fedonowitz one looks more traditional. Like um, it was just color call outs because there's no very little shadowing, very little shading, very little. Um, you know, yeah, it's just... very, very flat. If, if he used a hand, it was, uh, he was just doing kind of wet on wet, like, like color wash. But that does beg the question, uh, what were some of the materials you used on your stuff? I see a lot of airbrush for the backgrounds, for the, the fine gradients and things. But I'm also mm -hmm. curious about the dabby kind of paints. Like, I see some airbrush, sure. But uh, very curious about, like, what you painted these covers uh, with. The the interiors are 99% um, um, Dr. Martin's sure. um, colored inks. And... Um, and the color is on the for the paintings were acrylics because I I never I tried many times to um, get a handle on oil paints and that and it just was too too much um, I, they, it took too long to dry and they would get all muddy and so with acrylics you could lay them down a little bit faster and um, and and do some of those effects and it took it was easy to use um, more easy to use an airbrush on them so. So, did you guys, Peter? Did you have input on coloring? Was that something that you you guys passed back and forth and uh, thought about uh, what the turtle really, should look like? Not really. I, I I had pretty much total confidence in Kevin and what he was going to do because I'd seen a number of color pieces that he had done in the past, and he was, just, he was so good at it that it always struck me that I, I shouldn't get involved too much because I'd probably just screw it up. <laughs> This is the one April drawing that looks closest to the old uh, animated series than maybe any other April O'Neil in the Eastman and Laird's TMNT mm. series. <laughs> well, that may be where that jumpsuit came from. I'm pretty sure, yeah. No, I, and I, I have to say, just to, for perspective, um, I'd love to say that um, probably the longest story that Peter and I ever did individually before we started working together i think the longest story i ever did was eight pages um on my own peter with a concept called worm the barbarian story might have gone a little bit longer but we really hadn't done large stories <laughs> and that kind of stuff with consistent characters per se so when we worked on turtles one it was 40 pages that we got to share the chores on and to be honest we were figuring out how to draw things um yeah. uh, I, I certainly was and so I think we both had, um, I'm still incredibly frustrated drawing uh, women. Uh, it's very difficult um, uh, um, to, to make it work and, and to get a character to act and emote um, uh, anyway. So I think for some of these panels you do, I, I look at some of them and go, well, that one actually is pretty good. And then you look at another one and go, ooh, what happened there? Um, <laughs> but but it was, we were, we were really, you know, and even, you know, I like to point out that we were, um, I don't know this when I look at issue two and, and certainly all these early issues, it was you remember, you know, the the joy and, the, and the, the, that we got to got to do this. But we were really learning as we went. We Absolutely. Did, we didn't know a lot about storytelling, but we knew what we liked. We we were fan, genre fans. We had favorite comics that we liked and we we leaned heavily on those for uh, for inspiration for things. And uh, so, yeah, it was. Uh, it was quite a learning process and quite a quite a wonderful um, experience. My goodness! When we went through that first issue, uh, we saw you could see the confidence on the page. Certainly, you guys getting more comfortable with those duotone chemicals and and doing more technique and things as as the pages went on. It was it was really as astonishing to see. And there will be these bits like like well, we won't play the game of like who who set this page up, who paced this page, but like the storytelling to. For my taste, it's already masterful. You have this body shot of Leonardo holding the sword at this angle, and then completely different image of the Mousers. When you introduce both of these subjects in that third panel, the sword is brought around, conveys that motion, and puts both of these two drawings into the same space. 
Like that's mm. the beauty of comics to me right there in this three panel landscape section. Mm. Yeah, it's really strong. So I've got well, we a, a well, we had a lot of good teachers again. I think that, you know, um, the different artists that we liked, you know, whether it be the Basimas or Jack Kirby, certainly, uh, of course, Frank Miller was a big influence. But I just want to point out, too, that um, one of my favorite things about um, what we and it was a very big decision at the time uh, for Peter and I was that it was Pete's idea to do the uh, duo shade. Yeah, um, he had done lots of uh, wonderful illustrations for uh, different fanzines and newspapers and things and had experience with the duo shade technology and when we you know what the paper was and where to get it and i if i remember we couldn't find it at the local art store maybe or we had to order it through ohio graphic arts um, yeah, I think we actually got the uh, art supply store in portsmouth to order it for us they had a connection yep yeah and that was i think we were it was a discussion because um of the cost of the paper <laughs> Because you could buy it in these larger, I think, 17 by 22 inch sheets, which I, oddly enough, I still have about 200 sheets of duo shade and toner here. Whoa. Wow. The, the last guy in the planet that has it. You could probably but, sell those for a good profit. <laughs> well, you know, the worst part is I work with another artist um, on a on a thing, this fantastic artist named Freddie Williams, and he, he can replicate it on computer. So it's like, <laughs> no, the... Uh, um, but no, the duo shade, and that's why um, uh, any anybody that's seen in the original art um, for the early issues, um, because of the cost of the paper, and both Peter and I were, you know, I was cooking at a place called Horse Feathers, a restaurant in Horse Feathers, and Pete was working, doing side illustrations and things that, um, so the original paper, we could fit three, three pages, um, Roughly eight by uh, no seven by nine or eight by ten. So we get th we get three pages out of each individual sheet, and that's why all those early pages are done or done a little bit smaller. Um, but what a great because it was it was fantastic to me um, because Pete's idea of of taking this approach it didn't it wasn't just a a comic with black and white it was black and white and two shades of gray so we could really get some very unique wonderful effects um that you up until that you would seen maybe in mad magazine or things like that but it was uh it really changed the dynamic of the comic uh, considerably i felt and uh and wisely also um mr photocopy other known also known as peter laird we had a good idea that you know in case we messed up the duo shade we photocopied <laughs> we photocopied everything just in case, which then became very useful when we did color versions, because then we could um, have the clean, just ink work when we did the color, so. Super smart. Um, we, uh, carrying over from the last conversation, we were talking about the Duotone, and, and Pete, Peter, you said you remembered it being eight bucks. So yeah. uh, we were crunching the numbers uh, <laughs> on that. And in 1983, if you paid eight bucks for a sheet of Duo, duo Shade uh, paper uh, with 193% inflation, we're talking a piece of paper that costs twenty four bucks, twenty three dollars fifty cents. That's quite an investment for a couple of independent comic book artists. Yeah, you know, starting out certainly sets that work uh, aesthetically apart from all the all the other comics. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Rounding out this uh, this final issue, they're still in the sewer. It does have a complete ending. Are yeah. there any final thoughts? Uh, where where uh, issue two is concerned what was the print run on that on that uh second issue i believe the first printing of that was fifteen thousand. that's a lot of that's face trimming that's what i recall <laughs> so and, you... and that, that's actually a good question pete did because it is the the second story is i forgotten i know i guess um because issue three is we look say if we look when we look ahead to that i know we we'd envision a much longer story arc because we had the kind of the complete the car chase, that nutty car chase thing um, within the epilogue. Um, but I wonder, do you think we did issue two self-contained just because that's the way we did issue one? I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm not sure we were looking too far ahead at that, that point. I mean, <laughs> we we're happy that it seemed to be working and, you know, we were able to come up with a story that we were both happy with. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I think it was probably only a, a, a issue three that we really started planning a, a longer story that would, you know, which ended up taking the turtles into space and meeting the Triceratons and the Fugitoid and all that stuff. 
So let's take a look at issue number three. Yes, please. 